Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jerry Firestein. I'm the senior vice president here at the Middle East Institute. I want to thank everyone for coming out on this rainy afternoon uh, and uh, joining us for what we think is going to be an important conversation about the future development of U.S.-Pakistan relations. I want to extend a special uh, thanks to the Mahavesh and Jahangir Siddiqui Foundation that has co-sponsored with the Middle East Institute uh, the paper that Marvin Weinbaum and Syed Muhammad Ali uh, will be presenting this afternoon. Uh, I also want to thank the many subject matter experts uh, who shared their time and energy in the preparation of the paper and uh, in making today's event possible. Uh, as many, if not most of you in the room uh, understand and, and know, uh, there's perhaps no more significant uh, U.S. foreign policy issue uh, that has been more fraught over more years than the question of how best to manage our relationship with Pakistan. Uh, from the earliest years of the relationship until today, uh, we have together been on a roller coaster ride of miscommunication, uh, mistrust, and mutual over expectation, punctuated by periodic efforts to repair, reimagine, and repurpose uh, the relationship uh, to fit new developments. Over the course of my Foreign Service career, uh, I had a front row seat, and I even occasionally had a role in managing. Uh, the relationship as the two countries consistently fail to understand one another uh, or to recognize or acknowledge the other side's red lines or priorities. Uh, at the same time, I was witness to the efforts made by both sides to salvage the relationship and to recognize that we fundamentally shared common goals, strengthening regional security and stability, uh, a vision of a Pakistan that was strong, socially and economically successful, at peace with its neighbors, able and willing to play a positive role in the region, and a recognition that a strong U.S.-Pakistan relationship uh, was absolutely crucial if we were to succeed. Uh, there are a number of people in the room here today uh, who were in that same roller coaster car with me and can speak uh, also from personal experience. So I commend uh, Marvin and Syed Muhammad uh, and their colleagues uh, for once again weighing into the fray. Uh, but we might ask ourselves, and we should certainly ask our speakers today, uh, what's different about this time? Uh, why should we expect that the outcome this time will be any different than all of the times in the past when well-meaning people on both sides have come together uh, to try to reimagine and solidify the relationship. Uh, for me, I think the core answer is that the paper doesn't overpromise. Uh, there is no expectation uh, that we will be reviving that magical moment in history uh, when Pakistan, perhaps unrealistically, uh, prided itself on being America's most allied ally. Uh, instead, we will hear today a sober analysis of each side's interests and the possible scope of realistic frames of cooperation, politically, economically, and socially. Uh, in my view, the sense of realism that this paper incorporates can and must be the foundation of a sustainable relationship between the United States and Pakistan. As U.S. attention on Afghanistan and the region slips and Pakistan's energy turns, as it should, to focus more on its internal challenges, uh, we have opportunities to turn the page on our relationship and to see each other, perhaps for the first time, uh, without the benefit of either rose-tinted glasses or devil's horns. Uh, on that note, let me turn the proceedings over uh, to Ambassador Ali Siddiqui, uh, formerly Ambassador of Pakistan to the United States, and currently Ambassador at Large uh, for Pakistan for Foreign Investment. Thank you.
Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to see so many friends here. I've, um, I've not been to Washington for four months, and I, I can't believe there's so many people I haven't caught up with, but this is a great occasion. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to the Middle East Institute, Dr. Marvin Weinbaum, Dr. Sayed Muhammad Ali, for inviting me to share my comments on this very important piece of work, one that charts the future course of the relationship between our two countries. Historically, our relationship has been broad-based. Uh, we had significant economic cooperation. The U.S. was our largest foreign investor. At this time, it still is, but that will change, I think, because of China's investments. But nevertheless, we, we would welcome more U.S. investment. Beyond economic cooperation on the cultural uh, exchange side in education, we have had huge amounts of cooperation. I remember when I joined the government two and a half years ago, many of the leadership of the cabinet were educated in the U.S., and even today, our, our government is largely educated in the US or the UK. This partnership, while bilateral, also had, had, has led to regional developments and regional uh, uh, interventions that have been quite successful for both parties. Whether it was brokering the US-China relationship or whether it was fighting the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and more recently, counterterrorism cooperation between the two countries, this bilateral relationship has been responsible for much more in the region, which has been quite successful. Since the mid 2000s, however, this relationship has gone from being multifaceted to being unidimensional, to being really security focused. This has led to losses for both countries, where we've lost a lot of economic opportunity and, and lost in many other areas. When I arrived in Washington in 2018 to serve as Pakistan's ambassador, it was in this backdrop of a decade of a relationship that had deteriorated. Due to the context of the Afghan conflict, uh, the relationship had become, as I said, unidimensional. And while Pakistan was very keen to broaden it out, unfortunately, um, there were other considerations here that were ever present, which was that the US administration had a focus entirely on Afghanistan. So we did what we could. We, we, we did everything possible to the best of our ability to support the US's efforts to build peace in Afghanistan. And as you would have followed, the first phase of that was achieved quite recently. It's now time, therefore, to broaden for both countries this relationship in the backdrop of having achieved some success uh, together and also the, the overarching uh, large security piece of the Afghan, Afghan uh, conflict moving forward. This is why this policy paper is so important and is so timely. It represents a broad consensus of, of the Washington foreign policy establishment and academics on how important this relationship is to both countries and also what could serve as building blocks to build the foundations of a new partnership. I do want to thank the tremendous work that's been put in by, I understand, 20 scholars and foreign policy analysts and foreign and US government officials that have contributed to this study. Washington is a busy place and the administration and Capitol Hill, particularly in an election year, have a lot on their plate. In the small space that's available for foreign policy, there's a lot of crowding of larger issues. And I would hope that this paper serves as a focused document that can be shared with the foreign policy decision makers in the government so that this foundation that has been laid out can be supported and executed. And I hope that we can build a relationship between both countries that is based on the principles of respect and partnership and profit for both sides. Thank you. Well, let Marvin Weinbaum, the director of our Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, studies program, and uh, let me thank you again for your attendance here today. Uh, let me say what we're going to have now is I'm going to make some introductory remarks about the paper. Uh, my colleague, co-author here, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, is going to give you a little grasp about the paper itself, 
Now, it's online now, a very handsome PDF version, uh, lots of pictures. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, although we have some few hard copies, I understand, uh, really, I recommend that you examine it on, on, uh, online. Uh, so I was going to start my remarks uh, talking about what happens when you ask most analysts, <clears throat> followers of Pakistan, to describe what the, sum up what the history of the relationship has been. Uh, and uh, I, I was going to suggest here that without question, they would use the word roller coaster. Uh, Tacey Schaefer and her late husband uh, have a book where that's the title. Uh, it is, it has been, it has been uh, a relationship which is defined by the fact that it has waxed and waned. It has risen to heights of in, interdependence, mutual dependence, and has sunk into periods of uh, of recrimination, mutual recrimination. Yet, let me point out what why we've called this uh, seizing a moment for change, because we're in a period now where neither of those seem to fit. It seems to be a period of calm, really, in the relationship, and a good deal of, of cooperation. On the other hand, we're, we're not embracing one another entirely, on, on certainly on every issue. Now, you could say, well, then let's leave well enough alone. Uh, but knowing what we know about the relationship and what it's likely to continue to be this kind of ups and downs, uh, waxing and weaving. It struck us that this was a very, very opportune moment in which to, in a deliberative way, think about the relationship and perhaps be able to make the kind of decisions or agreements or understandings which would not be possible if we were in a period of, of crisis or perhaps great expectations uh, which likely to be dashed. So this is, a, uh, this is an opportunity here for us, we thought, to advance some ideas which could better put the relationship on, on solid footing so that it could avoid the kind of uh, swings that we have seen regularly for all of these years. Now, having said this, I think that we have to be realistic. Uh, there was a long time where virtually everybody who wrote about Pakistan said, well, it's just a matter of establishing better trust. Uh, that was wrong. That was wrong because that assumed that we had necessarily, uh, on a broad broad front, we had interests that really fit together, except we just didn't have the wherewithal uh, of thinking about it in the right way. And we just had to find the right words and, and so on to make it work. Well, I don't think we should have any illusions here. We do have differences. It's very clear we have differences today over India, or over Afghanistan, over China. Uh, but this only underscores, I think, the need for, for this kind of understanding of where we have interests that coincide and where we should accept there are going to be differences and be able to, to, to accommodate ourselves to that. Uh, we certainly want to avoid something like the divorce that we saw going in 1990. Uh, when uh, virtually uh, for a decade, uh, we had no real relationship with, with Pakistan. And we paid a heavy price for that. We suffered for that. Uh, this is a different time. 
in the 1990s when this was occurred, there were the, the region was not a, a nuclearized one. We didn't hear of anything called global terrorism, at least on the scale that we see it today. So this comes, I think, to pointing out that we do, the United States, have some real interests in this region. Some people would like to see us simply move on, especially if we are able to extract ourselves from Afghanistan uh, and move on from the region as well as perhaps from this uh, endless war. But what I want to argue, and I think that the paper uh, underscores, is that we have some objectives that this region, why this region, and particularly Pakistan, together with Afghanistan, are, are so critical for. Uh, one is obviously that we still have an ongoing efforts here to eliminate Al-Qaeda, uh, affiliated terrorist organizations, and now, of course, Islamic State, or ISIS, if you wish. We need Pakistan's influence here as we move, particularly as we face a pending disengagement of American foreign forces. We need now its engagement, its, its influence to help facilitate here. Uh, the achieving of a peaceful and stable Afghanistan. I say, I say again, particularly because we are reducing our, our footprint there. We, we need Pakistan because it is the custodian of a nuclear armory. Arsenal. Uh, and we are deeply concerned about, continue to be, uh, about nuclear proliferation. And we need to be able to talk to Pakistan in the way we have to, because there is, especially because it is now a, both India and Pakistan are nuclearized, we need to be able to be there using whatever leverage we have along with the international community, to make sure that there does not erupt here a, a conflict, a major conflict, which could have global implications, regional certainly, but global, humanitarian uh, and, and, and beyond. Now, I want to now just go on and say, again, as Jerry Firestein pointed out, this, was a, this has been a group effort. Uh, in the PDF that I've spoken of, uh, there are the acknowledgments here of all those who have participated. And in a little while, I'm going to ask some of the people who have been participating and made such important contributions to come up and, and say a few words about how they view the relationship and where they see the paper perhaps advancing uh, in the fashion I've already just indicated. Uh, it is combined, combined thinking of, of academics, uh, of think tank analysts, of former government officials, some of whom could not sign this because of their uh, other, of, I should say there are some people who are unable to solve because of their position. And we, re of course, we have to un uh, respect that. But we're delighted to see the large number of people who participated with us who have, uh, in effect, uh, endorsed uh, our recommendations, uh, if not all of them, at least uh, enough for them to want to, to be recorded as having done so. This paper does specifically, in addition to Re, uh, describing the context for it, lay out a series of recommendations. But other recommendations can be abstracted from the text itself. So it was not an effort here to uh, 
to find every possible area. But we think that these recommendations are, uh, many of them are, are deliverable, uh, and at least uh, they should be our goals. So what I'm going to do now is to introduce uh, Muhammad Ali, who um, it's been a pleasure to work with him as well as with the group. But um, he's going, as I say, to lay out <coughs> some of what's, <coughs> what's in the paper and also um, to lay the ground for what will be, along with the remarks of the participants, an opportunity for you to come back to us with your remarks, uh, and we will leave time for that before we conclude. Uh, so, uh, Sayed Muhammad Ali, who is a adjunct professor at Georgetown and George Mason Universities. Thank you, uh, Marvin. So I will now present uh, summarized highlights of the consensus view of a diverse group of area experts concerning potential convergences in the realm of security cooperation with regards to economic development and environmental issues and relevant sociopolitical concerns. U.S.-Pakistan relations have long been dominated by strategic compulsions. And although broadening the bilateral cooperation is important, evolving security issues will continue to demand attention. Besides facilitating the U.S.-Taliban peace agreement, um, Pakistan's role in enabling intra-Afghan negotiations remains vital. <laughs> Pakistan's cooperation is also important, like Marvin mentioned, for preventing global terrorists to use Afghanistan as a launching ground for future attacks. Besides continuing intelligence sharing on specific militant groups, such as Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State, the US can encourage increased Pakistani and Afghanistani intelligence cooperation which will assume, although it's difficult, that's going to assume increased importance following a U.S. troop uh, withdrawal. The U.S. also faces a challenge in how to address India-Pakistan tensions over the Kashmir situation, given its growing relationship with India and India's strong aversion to outside involvement. Yet, given the, the danger of catastrophic escalation that the current situation presents, the U.S. must remain prepared to play an active role in crisis management and mediation, even if its physical presence from, from the region wanes. It's not feasible for the U.S. to match Chinese investments in Pakistan. But the U.S. need not have a zero-sum view of growing Chinese involvement in Pakistan. The U.S. can help address some of the opacity concerns surrounding CPAC projects, as it has provided technical input to other countries such as Myanmar and Sri Lanka to assess Belt and Road terms and conditions if the Pakistani government is receptive to those ideas. It is in the interest of the U.S. to help bolster Pakistan's economy to enable it to pursue some of the riskier decisions that a foreign policy more convergent with U.S. interests may require. In this regard, expanded export opportunities are a win-win for both sides, but especially for Pakistan, given the relative sizes of the two economies. Pakistan has made progress in enhancing its attractiveness as a commercial partner. So this is a good time now for the newly created U.S. Development Finance Corporation to spearhead a coordinated effort to identify key investment projects in which American firms have technological and economic advantage, such as information technology and the energy sectors. The U.S. can also align and supplement CPEC projects, the Chinese-Pakistani Economic Cooperation project, uh, uh, projects, particularly via green technology investments led by the private sector. 
providing, providing needed alternatives to coal-dependent CPEC energy projects. The US government can facilitate this process as well by creating a mechanism to mobilize finance for clean energy projects in Pakistan. Like, uh, 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 like the US-India Clean Energy Finance Task Force. So something along those lines. The US can encourage broader regional cooperation on cleaner energy projects as well. Uh, the India-Pakistan-Iran gas pipeline has been blocked as an outgrowth of US tensions with Iran. But the US government can help fast track the Ahwan component of the Turkmenistan-Afghanistan-Pakistan-India gas pipeline. Uh, while also simultaneously encouraging India and Pakistan to complete their segments of this so-called peace pipeline. There is untapped potential of using Pakistani professional associations uh, within America to meet unmet medical needs of underserved areas in the US and to train Pakistani doctors. Pakistani entrepreneurs can offer business internships and create help create social impact in investments and bolster social entrepreneurship in Pakistan. The US can work with Pakistan to develop an industry-led ethical sourcing program for the textile and garment sector. A narrow bilateral trade agreement on reinvigorating uh, an Afghanistan-Pakistan reconstruction opportunity zone are other possibilities, but a gradual and incremental approach is advised to these more ambitious, but harder to implement initiatives. Non-security funding to Pakistan remains vital to assist with poverty alleviation, to contend with environmental challenges. US aid can also facilitate some of the above mentioned economic opportunities, such as the creation of ethical supply chains of textile products sourced from Pakistan. Now, in the nine post 9-11 context, Pakistan, like many uh, other countries around the world, has found it difficult to balance security needs without encroaching on civil liberties and human rights. Of late, Pakistan has allowed its security concerns to prevent citizens from expressing dissent, to impede the work of civil society organizations, or even suppress media freedoms the US should make it clear that Pakistan's handling of these issues has important bearing on the political will and support necessary for addressing Pakistan's legitimate concerns. When it comes to concerns about authoritarian tendencies, protecting the rights of women or, the, or those of the minorities, the US State Department and other relevant federal agencies could adopt a broader regional approach to discussing these problems, given that Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and India also face very similar challenges. This, in turn, would help avert such discussions from becoming viewed as a convenient cudgel to admonish Pakistan. The US government can also facilitate increased interactions and collaborations between South Asian civil society groups, journalists, and academics working on the above common problems and on regional environmental threats. Finally, to strengthen the US diplomatic standing in the region, an assistant secretary of state for South Asia needs to be confirmed as soon as possible. So there's th this, in a nutshell, are uh, some, some of the findings and, of course, the more fleshed out um, version of these and more specific recommendations are, are available in our policy paper. At this time, I... As I said, I'd like to invite up to the podium um, members of the group. Uh, and uh, I, I think that this will be uh, perhaps the most valuable part of, of the program. Uh, I'm going to start by asking uh, Toke Hossein, Ambassador Toke Hossein, who was a, a Pakistani ambassador 
uh, and is today uh, uh, a adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, Took care. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, I'm happy to have been part of the deliberations that led to the preparation of the report. Uh, thanks, Marvin and Muhammad Ali, for your hard work. As you have heard in this introduction given by them and by my friend Jerry Feierstein, the report aims to highlight the importance of U.S.-Pakistan relationship for the future interests of the two countries and suggests areas of possible convergence. And I agree with most of its findings. My brief remarks here are limited to giving you my personal understanding of why this relationship is important and why it has not been sustainable in the past and how we can make it work in the future. Over the last more than six decades, the U.S.-Pakistan relations have served some of the vital interests of the two countries, but not without some cost to each of them. The reason is it has not been a normal bilateral relationship. It has been marked by paradoxes. It has been one of the most talked about relationships, but arguably one of the least understood. In their engagements, though Pakistan enjoyed a high profile aid relationship with the United States, it did not reflect a long-term American policy towards Pakistan based on a larger conceptual framework, a shared vision or continuity. The relationship was inflated but not strategic. Attempts by the United States and Pakistan to create such a strategic framework was foiled by contradictions, contradictions within their own relationship and between their other strategic interests. The reality is Pakistan and the United States saw the relationship in different ways for different reasons. The United States treated its engagement with Pakistan as one-off, and this often started well but ended badly. Sanctions was a poor way of dealing with Pakistan. It provo they provoked anger but did not hurt. Now, where do we go from here? The future should not be dictated by the past 18 years when the relationship got entangled with a troubled war. And any attempts to develop the strategic consensus between the two countries ran up against U.S. interests with India and competition with China. As the relationship was relegated to transactional status, there too were problems. The problem was the relationship had no sustainable framework. The United States has to realize that if it wants Pakistan's cooperation, it has to have good policies. The test of a good policy should not be that it only looks good in Washington. Bad policies not only affect U.S. interests, but those of its partners who are then tempted to take advantage of Washington and start safeguarding their interests, often with policies that are inconsistent with U.S. interests. So where do we go from here? As I said, the U.S. can withdraw from Afghanistan, but not from the region. Even in Afghanistan, it may be walking away, but not abandoning Afghanistan. It's heavily invested in the region. Look at the relations with India and competition with China. Pakistan will have a role in all this. But Washington has to make up its mind as to what would be the best way to get Pakistan's cooperation by extracting concessions through continued pressure or by involving Pakistan in a long 
mutually beneficial relationship that is compatible with its overall U.S. Engage, with the overall engagement with South Asia. If the United States can handle the complexities of its relationship with Pakistan successfully by finding a modus vivendi with China and developing a South Asia policy that balances its geopolitical strategy, regional interests, and bilateral relations, there could be opportunities for both Pakistan and United States for an enhanced relationship. U.S. relations with India are important, and they should continue, but they may not be the answer to all the challenges the United States faces in the region. Washington should also keep in mind that given India's size and ambition, it could become a U.S. strategic competitor in the long run. So the United States also needs to have good relations with Pakistan. As a medium-sized country with serious security-related challenges and threats Pakistan is facing, Pakistan is an obvious ally for the United States. Successful navigation of all the challenges by Pakistan would require good relations with all big powers. Pakistan needs the United States. Pakistan has to realize, though, that if it really wants to change in U.S. policies, it too has to do some things. It has to strengthen the governance, especially economy. A moderate and economically strong Pakistan will raise U.S. confidence in it as a strategic and economic partner. Pakistan also has to understand that opposition to some of the core interests of the United States will have no lasting place in U.S.-Pakistan relations. Let me conclude. Both countries need to make special efforts to make this relationship work. Washington's policy of treating the relationship as a one-night stand will benefit neither country. We have to go beyond that. Thank you, Tokir, for those very thoughtful remarks. Um, Polly, Polly Nayak, uh, would you like to make a few remarks? Uh, Polly is a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Institute. She has a longer <laughs> background, a biographic, biographical background, but we will we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Marvin. I'm going to keep my remarks relatively brief, in part because we've just heard an outstanding um, presentation of the pushes and pulls uh, that we inherit today as we try to rethink this relationship. As, uh, as Taukiri said, uh, the, the question of what a normal relationship should entail with Pakistan for the US was, was uh, foremost in, in shaping our discussion. We, um, I personally operate off a spectrum, which is mental rather than um, written, of uh, models of relationships in which the US relationship with England and several other uh, English-speaking countries lie on one end, and on the other end, the far end, is North Korea. So there's a lot of space in between in which to try to optimize the commonalities and the uh, potential benefits of a U.S.-Pakistan relationship. I do want to hammer home one thing that Marvin said, which is that, that this is a very good time to turn the page and not to um, repeat exactly what Ambassador Siddiqui um, said. I do think that in some ways, the smallness of the space in the United States for foreign policy in the middle of domestic elections might actually be a plus, not a minus. And in my opinion, that fact that most of the attention is on one or two problem areas uh, and the rest is on elections may be an opportunity. Sometimes being uh, under the radar is a good place to be. And I actually think the relationship uh, has has space to move in the current environment. I wanted to really congratulate the authors for incorporating something that several of us in the group that 
uh, contributed to this report felt was extremely uh, important and somewhat neglected. And that's the room for private sector collaboration between Pakistanis and Americans. And uh, I certainly am aware, as aware as any American businessman who's tried to do business in Pakistan, that there are areas of, um, shall we say, uh, different corporate cultures which will need to be narrowed. But there are very promising organizations that specifically try to extend cooperation between the private sectors in different countries and to navigate those differences, the, the corporate cultural differences and the social uh, cultural differences. I want to say that from my vantage point, the single most important uh, interest that uh, the U.S. can uh, cooperate with Pakistan on from a Pakistani perspective has to be the economy. It has to be job creation. It has to be greater employment and less underemployment of the youth bulge that has hit uh, Pakistan's leaders um, with uh, a long lead up. We all knew it was coming, but the economy is not in good shape to uh, accommodate those newcomers to the economy. And so one of the big problems that uh, Pakistan faces is job creation in an environment where they've been losing jobs. And I think uh, that um, uh, Tawkir and uh, Ambassador Siddiqui and Muhammad Ali have covered a lot of the specifics. Uh, I think that uh, the social responsibility area is one that was made for cooperation between US and Pakistani companies. And I very much hope that as part of that, the, given the uh, deficit in job training uh, in, in Pakistan at this time, it might be an area in which these companies could collaborate. Um, I also wanted specifically to mention that I think the single most important thing that, that collaboration might bring about is a better support system for small and medium enterprises in Pakistan. And I think both sides have assets that could be uh, combined to make that happen, along perhaps uh, with aid, international, US, and uh, other friends. So uh, I, I, to, as far as I'm concerned, a normal relationship between the two will be heavily economic. It will be re rethinking areas where we have stumbled. Uh, I think it will be moving economic um, cooperation out of the framework where it has been for some time, the, uh, the framework of um, uh, strategic uh, cooperation where the economy was simply a subset of uh, strategic cooperation, such as it was, flawed as it was, between two countries with uh, somewhat divergent interests uh, on the ground in the uh, region. So in my, my view, ending that framework but not attempting to be too strategic, going for practical gains. And uh, as I believe uh, Tauke said earlier, um, keep being modest in our expectations is really the, uh, the key contribution that this paper has made. I am not ignoring, I have spent many years thinking about uh, Pakistan's custody of nuclear weapons, deterrence, and all of those issues. They haven't gone anywhere and they will continue to be uh, important subjects of side discussions, but they needn't be the heart of rebuilding uh, these ties. So with that, um, I am going to step down. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Polly. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, of course. Okay. He has a class. <laughs> uh, Polly, uh, thank you so much. You know, I mentioned some major aims that we have. On, on reflection, it doesn't seem like we can really realize those objectives if Pakistan is economically unstable and politically unstable. Polly's emphasis here on the private sector leads me naturally to ask if he would say a few words, Dana Marshall. Uh, Dana is uh, the president of Transnational Strategy Group. Dana?
Th thanks very much, uh, Marvin. And you know, when you called me and, and asked, you described this um, study that we're going to do with the support of the MEI and with Ambassador Siddiqui's foundation. I really asked you whether um, we were going to try to think along the lines of um, one of my favorite philosophers, Yogi Berra, who, who once said that the future isn't what it used to be. Um, and I asked whether this report was going to be looking at ways to make the future different than it used to be. And I think a number of people have tried to say the same idea in different ways, the turning of a page. I think um, former presidential uh, candidate Pete Buttigieg put it very well when he said once that the reason why things are so seem so unstable right now is because we're moving from one chapter to another, but we haven't yet turned that page. So the task, and um, it was a very interesting one with a very diverse group of people, was to look at what can be done to seize the advantage, to leverage this change. And a lot of discussions, I mean, my own focus, as Marvin has said, has, was more on the economic and commercial side of the equation. Because like many people that look at this, people realize that this has been one of the more underperforming areas and it need not be. Anybody who have had any contact with the Pakistan business community realize that there are world-class businesses uh, among them. They have vision, they are educated, they have resources, they have products, they have services uh, that can be expanded uh, mut to mutual benefit between the two countries. A number of ideas have been generated by the United States and Pakistan over, let's say, a 15-year period to try to do just that, um, starting from the 9-11 Commission report back in 04, which laid the groundwork of connecting economic progress with stability. Uh, there was an attempt to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty, which is a very powerful tool that countries have to try to promote and protect investment. Uh, that started in 04 and kind of died in 2015. Um, there was, of course, as has been mentioned, a um, project to create so-called reconstruction opportunity zones, which was an effort to use the American economy as a way to incentivize investment in Pakistan and the border area between Pakistan and Afghanistan and within Afghanistan to permit a wide range of products that would have been produced in those zones to enter the United States duty-free. More recently, in fact, the last year, we've had Senator Lindsey Graham traveling to Pakistan in the office of the prime minister saying, uh, we need an FTA. He says, quote, it is now time for the United States to have a strategic relationship with Pakistan, which is best achieved by a free trade agreement tied to security performance. And of course, last but certainly not least, is a conversation <clears throat> conversation between the president and the prime minister at the UNGA and earlier last year where the president in his very direct style says we're going to increase trade with Pakistan by a tremendous margin. We do a very small amount of trade with them and they want to do large and so do we and we should be able to do that. So we have all of this stuff from the sort of US Pakistan side. What is also important to recognize from the U.S. China, from the Pakistan China side, uh, wh whereas there has been a lot of talk and not frankly a lot of concrete initiatives put into place, the Chinese have not been so restrained. The Chinese uh, began negotiating a free trade area agreement with Pakistan, uh, and it, which took effect in July of 07. It has been further expanded to include trade and services, which is a very sophisticated form of international trade. That's in there. And obviously, their CPEC, uh, though it is controversial in some quarters, I don't think anyone can deny that that has dominated the Pakistan economic space. So I came into this with those kinds of things uh, in mind. Also, to add to that very briefly, um, Pakistan has been cited as one of the top 10 business climate improving nations by the World Bank in the last few months. And the IMF, of course, has focused on how its stabilization of some of its imbalances have uh, set the ground for even further economic growth. So 
those, all of those factors, I think, led to the very specific recommendations that we have here. The last thing I would say, Marvin and Ambassador Siddiqui, that I'm hoping that this paper that a lot of us in a labor of love worked on is not the end, but really is the beginning of a process. Thank you. Thank you. William Milam, would you like to say a few words? Well, I wasn't planning to, but I'll, I'll do so. Well, okay, you can keep them brief, because I, I think there's some others who will also follow you. Please, Bill is former U.S. ambassador to Pakistan, and that's, I think, probably where we first met. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think so. Yeah. Yes. And it's been good days ever since, Mark. <laughs> sure. Uh, I actually was uh, I'm unprepared to say anything because I wasn't expected to be called on. I didn't participate in drafting the paper because uh, I got taken down by some uh, health issues uh, in the last 10 days. I'm back on my feet, obviously. But that's when the drafting took place. I nagged Marvin a lot uh, by email about it, and he, uh, uh, and he, must, he won't forget that, I'm quite sure. Uh, I am, I think, maybe the ghost of Christmas past, not Christmas so much as the relationship past, because um, when Marvin asked me to be a member of the group, I came with the attitude of why change what seems to be working? Uh, and what I heard was enough great ideas in the first few, I attended all the meetings up until about two weeks ago. Uh, that I thought this may be uh, turn out to be a little different than I've seen before. And when I say that, I mean uh, the fact that I've participated in other, uh, shall we say, pre-election, pre-U.S. election uh, papers on how to uh, better our relationship with Pakistan, Particularly, I remember 2008 when there were almost every think tank who did anything on Pakistan had a had a uh, a committee working on the relationship. Many times they called it "Is Pakistan going to fail or not?" But the failure was always in the relationship, I think, rather than the uh, the country. Uh, I, in fact, I never knew what failure was. Um, but I want to say that uh, the other thing that that uh, other things that convinced me that this was uh, going to be a pretty good effort, a good effort really, uh, was one, uh, I was ambassador in the period that Marvin spoke of when we really didn't have a relationship, when there was almost nothing there, no American investment, all the American, uh, uh, you know, aid and other things was turned off because of sanctions from 1998 to 2001. That was not a good time to be there. I had a great deal of fun there. I, I met wonderful people and had a, a great reception everywhere. And uh, we did were uh, actually uh, able to do some things. When the crises hit, like the Cargill thing, we were able to uh, intervene, and, uh, not intervene, that's the wrong word, but uh, to be involved and be helpful, I think. But frankly, it was as a as a place to to get things done as a as a relationship. There was not much there. Second reason uh, that I think uh, this paper is helpful that I think this paper is a good idea and that's uh, really gotten is going to hopefully be studied carefully is that I think it's almost certain that there's going to be another. I don't think rupture is the right word, but another blow up in the relationship. I mean. As the Afghan peace process begins to fall apart, which I think it will, uh, we're going to expect things out of Pakistan that it won't want to do. And there we'll go back through the same sort of the bottom of the roller coaster, shall we say. Maybe we'll, maybe not. Maybe we'll avoid that. I hope so. In any case, uh, but what really, and this is really all I'm going to say, what really impressed me was the way that we, we the group, the group went around, went about uh, putting together some ideas. And the ideas you've heard from Polly and particularly from Muhammad Ali on the economic side, on the development side, struck me 
not as new ideas, but as ideas we hadn't really considered much before and another way to build a relationship. It'll take time. It's not going to be, it's not going to solve the next uh, a down, downturn of the relationship. But over time, it's really, uh, I think, the best way, uh, the best, it points out ways that we can really develop a better relationship, which Marvin and the others have laid out is certainly in our interests as well as in Pakistan's interests. So I'll leave you and go back to my ghost like work. <laughs> Bill's remarks uh, and the others too lead me to, we're, we haven't finished from hearing from our members, but uh, I think one of the important points being made here is that we need to have more dialogue on this than we've had. There hasn't been enough serious discussion. And in that vein, I hope that if you read the paper and you find it useful, that you'll circulate it. With other, among others, where we'll do everything we can to make sure at the policy level, at the public uh, uh, acquaint, acquaintance area of uh, opportunity that we follow up on it as well. Uh, we have uh, just a few minutes, but there are two other people who I wanted. We're not ready for questions quite yet. <laughs> uh, Two other people, if they would briefly say something, because oh, I said we do want to get the questions, but I want to have just as important that I give them an opportunity. Uh, Robin Rayfield. Uh, Robin is, among many other things, former <laughs> Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia. I'm rushing up here so I can be quick um, so we can get to questions from the audience. Uh, first of all, this is a very timely product, and I want to commend the drafters because those of us who were participating were slow off the mark. Uh, we would reconsider, and the night before the thing was due, we'd send 16 paragraphs in and, and want them to be <laughs> incorporated. So it, it really is extremely well done, and I want to thank the drafters for that. Um, this is a timely moment for the reasons that everyone has suggested, that Afghanistan's moving to a new phase. We're going to have a new administration, maybe continuation of the same, but there are bound to be many efforts to rethink one policy or another. So there is there is a timely opportunity for input. One thing I was really glad about with this paper is we're no longer debating whether Pakistan and the relationship is important. You know, there's been a lot of talk with Afghanistan that once, once Afghanistan is sorted, then we don't have to be troubled with Pakistan anymore. That is, is very much gone in this paper and I, I think in reality. Many good recommendations in the paper, as you'll see when you read it. But in order to implement them, um, we're going to have to be very proactive and hands-on, or we're going to fall back to old narratives. So I think that's really important. And we're going to have to rely on diplomacy, uh, not just our old pressure techniques, um, and remain very sensitive to the feeling on one side or the other that there is a great deal of hypocrisy in our policies and attitudes towards one another. I mean, we look at Pakistan with all respect, they complain about Kashmir, but are silent on the Uyghurs. And the list of issues on which Americans are viewed as hypocritical is longer than that even, so we both need to be sensitive to that. Uh, remarks on a, on a couple of the neighbors, China, we do need to accept that China is there to stay. I think the paper makes the point very well. There are potential areas in which we can cooperate. There might even be opportunities for American firms, but there's certainly the opportunity to help the Pakistanis better evaluate this whole huge 60 plus billion dollar effort uh, so that they get the best deal they can from uh, China. Uh, we can't compete directly. We don't have those sorts of resources, but Americans need to remain cognizant of their comparative advantage, and we have many of them. Technology, management, education, and so on, and many of these relate to the economic relationship, which everyone has noted as key. Uh, on India, the paper 
says very correctly, we need to be prepared to take a more active role in crisis management should uh, things erupt uh, in this currently very tense period. But I also think we need to think, and this is happening uh, both in government and outside, we kind of need to rethink what our expectations are from our relationship with India, and that will ultimately redound on how we view Pakistan as well. Um, two closing points. One, to remember, this is not about money. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this has really gotten us in difficulties over the years, whether it was security assistance or economic assistance. And, conditionality and, and trying to spend too much money too fast and so on and so forth. Uh, we do need to continue our assistance programs, but they need to be very deliberate and they need to be um, in, in closer consultation than we've had with our Pakistani partners so that we're not just hiring contractors to do what we want to do rather than have a real agreement on what the priorities are. And then finally, there is a cost to not acting. And as I said, we need to be proactive. We need to be conscious uh, that this is an important relationship. Thank you, Marvin. I wanted to ask, I still want to ask Taisy Schaefer if she'd like to just make two, three minutes worth of remarks, if you would. I'm sorry about that, but uh, you understand the constraint. Taisy, uh, former ambassador to Sri Lanka and deputy secretary for uh, Middle East and South Asia. I first met uh, both Jerry and Marvin in Pakistan. Marvin was a Fulbrighter. We were in a play together. Uh, and I also first met Tokyo in Pakistan, and our kids went to the same nursery school. I just have a couple of really short observations. What's different about this time around? Always there has been one issue that was kind of in the driver's seat. It wasn't always the same one for both countries. In the 50s, the Cold War for us, India for Pakistan, and India has always been at least co-owner of the first place for Pakistan. Uh, and bureaucratically, that meant the armies and the intelligence services on both sides. Uh, later on, Afghanistan got into the driver's seat. And I think that that is what we will eventually be exiting. But it's not over yet, because I think the peace agreement, under the best interpretation, has a lot more bumps to go through in the road. Um, the other thing that's different is that when I mentioned the issues in the driver's seat, I didn't mention anything economic. And I would like to echo what a lot of you have said. That needs to be the next frontier uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is it's clearly needed. Uh, the other is I think it has been a thorn in Pakistan's side that the Afghanistan issue was in the driver's seat, but that put Pakistan in some sense in the position of being the junior partner, which I think was understandably offensive to an awful lot of Pakistanis. And the one thing that we could do together where that wouldn't have that effect would be economic cooperation. My final thought, which is a cautionary note, Yes to working more in the private sector. That is not something that the, that the US government controls. In fact, the Pakistan government, in a sense, comes closer to controlling that because it, it sets the policy environment. So with appropriate recognition of what we can and can't control ourselves, I heartily endorse that. Thank you. The program will be uh, on uh, available as a video viewing. Uh, it'll probably be a day or two. But again, the, the, the paper is now available on the website. I'm going to ask those who have spoken 
uh, on the, from the group, if they'd come up here and answer the, que answer the questions. Because uh, I think we'll have, uh, uh, again, uh, a, a panel of people who I think can handle anything. So if, if, you, would, if you would come up, uh, Bill, if, if, if your health, <laughs> come on, uh, Polly. Yeah, and, and let me start by uh, saying, uh, please use the microphone because uh, we are recording. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Then, so, uh, let me take let me take two questions immediately here and then there, please. I am a P Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, despite the current focus on Islamist issues. In the very long term, the number one U.S. interest is turning down the heat between India and Pakistan. I can imagine uh, a series of trade zones, uh, sort of like the Quezon Industrial Complex between North and South Korea, along the India-Pakistan border, which would bring in Indian capital and Pakistani labor, and probably some interest from U.S. companies. Also, I can imagine a free trade uh, regime between India and Pakistan eventually. Are Anybody thinking along those two lines in, uh, in casting the future? Well, I want to get two questions in because we're, we're trying to get as many as possible. Uh, yes. Thank you. The gentleman back there who's been very anxious to ask a question. Um, I'm Riaz Haider. I'm Riaz Haider. Uh, I have some comments. You could answer those if you like. My first one is the restoration of trust. Please, one question. Please, one question. Okay. I'll just make it one. There's a doctor, Afridi. He cooperated with the United States um, in the vaccination program to obtain some specimen of blood from Osama bin Laden. He thought he was helping both Pakistan as well as America. He was, he was later on imprisoned. He is still in prison in spite of America making many efforts of his release. And the latest is that he is going on hunger strike. So when it comes to restoration of trust, yeah. tell me what can be done in this regard, please. Okay, panelists, you want to take the first one? Let me take the first one because um, that's really remarkable that you asked that question. In fact, the re representative of the U.S. Institute of Peace has just left, but USIP actually about four years ago retained our firm to do a study of exactly that point, creating a special economic zone that would straddle the India-Pakistan border. That report was done. It was not a political report. We got into real nitty gritty commercial aspects of that. Uh, report came out saying that it was feasible. USIP wanted just to do a phase two to go to both countries, national governments, the um, sub uh, national uh, governments, and of course the business communities and start moving that forward. And then regrettably the political relationship between the two countries went down. Report still on the shelf. It's still available. Uh, and I think it still is very valuable for the reasons that you said. It's on our firm's website if you want to see it, or USIP. So it, thank you for that. Uh, you know, uh, Ambassador, if you'd like to also make any remarks on, on this, please. Hello. Polly? I was actually going to pass the vote. Yeah. On, okay. On I, don't, I don't have well, a, why a don't second we, question. Exactly, I, don't I, think, I think you should answer this one. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm uh, familiar with uh, Dr. Freedy's situation, um, and I understand where you're coming from, but he did violate the law in Pakistan, and he was convicted. Now, I can't say more than that. There are cases on the other side, for example, where uh, there are people in prison in this country, and we have a certain view, but they've gone through a judicial process. So having gone through a judicial process, the government's hands are tied. So I, I really don't know what else to, to say on that. I, I can't comment on the uh, India-Pakistan kind of trade idea. It's, it's a great idea. I was not aware that there's some work has been done. So thank you for letting me know and I'll read up on it. Um, it's a sensible idea. There was some, uh, there was some, I wouldn't call it a study, but I would say there was some calculations done uh, 10 years ago or eight years ago about how the two countries could benefit from trade. I remember reading that if we, if Pakistan were to purchase diesel, um, uh, from India as opposed to importing it from the Middle East, we would save hundreds of millions of dollars in freight savings alone. 
on the other side, uh, Pakistan has surplus capacity for fertilizer production. India is one of the world's largest consumers and importers of fertilizer. We have surplus plant capacity. So, and we are many of our plants straddle the border with India. So we could produce more and export to them. Now, all of these things require the political side to work, including the, the economic zones you speak about. That would be an incentive. But as you know, Pakistan has been trying very hard for now a number of years to for rapprochement. But, but on the Indian side, there's less reci reciprocity. So I think the US, we've been asking the US to play a role in that. And uh, while the administration has raised the issue, I think there's an opportunity for the US to be very proactive and step step in. Uh, every time India has said that this is a, an issue that they do not want a third party involved, the US has stepped back. But it's so important. And I think the issues of India, Pakistan, the fact that both countries are nuclear uh, countries has been raised in this discussion also. I think it's an important enough issue that the US can step in politically. And then of course, there's a lot to be gained for everyone. I did want to add one um, comma to your comments, which I think are, are right on, except that I frankly believe the, that India and Pakistan have to resolve their own relationship. We're speaking to the mic. And I would point out that um, in 2002, after the confrontation uh, along the entire international border uh, and uh, 10 months of nose-to-nose uh, uh, -nose troop deployments, what brought India and Pakistan back, besides a face-saving intervention by the US, was uh, their own talks the following fall. And I, my own belief is that depending on third parties to mediate between two countries with such fundamental passions is not realistic. So I'm differing from, from your suggestion in that regard. I do think we have a role in, uh, in um, crisis management along with a number of international partners. And I, I think it has to be said here that Pakistan has to understand what an irritant in the relationship the incarceration of Dr. Afridi has been. Uh, Pakistan has its own issues on, on, on the holding of, uh, uh, of people uh, which, seem, which seem to be for political reasons. Uh, it's important that we recognize these are there uh, and, uh, and appreciate, uh, say, the depth of uh, concern here. Tacey, do you want to say something on this? Yeah, with respect to the trade issue that you brought up, a slightly different proposal reached actually quite a serious stage just before Modi was elected in 2015. Unfortunately, it was, this was just going to be opening normal trade between India and Pakistan. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't get anywhere. Uh, I've heard different and surprise, surprise, contradictory explanations for why. But that would be the easier one to do because you're not making assumptions on other people's behalf about who contributes labor and who contributes money. Uh, questions? All right, let's take two. Two first hands. I saw this woman here and the gentleman back there. So first in the second row and then in the fourth row. The people of Pakistan um, have to be on board uh, and uh, they really do and would uh, greatly um, uh, honor this uh, mutual uh, relationship. But what is happening across the border at the moment as we speak, CAA and so on, I mean, there's been nothing at all uh, done um, here in the US. So um, what I want to say is that it would be really nice to have some involvement and absolutely um, this, uh, there can be, I mean, and there should be. So it's a gross human rights issue. You're speaking of Kashmir. No, 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 the CAA, what's happening, I mean, to Indian citizens. Oh, so, yes, Indian oh, yes, Indian citizens. You're right, yes, okay. Indian yes. citizens. Yes, yes, of course, I'm who've sorry. Who've been there yeah. for generations. Yes, of course, yes. Uh, so this gentleman back here. 
another human rights question, but why should the U.S. Uh, continue to increase investment in Pakistan and build a stronger relationship when there are thousands of Sindhis who have been forcibly disappeared? Uh, with no judicial process, uh, and the government has done nothing about it, despite calls from the Pakistan Human Rights Commission. Uh, is this a call for a broader look at human rights in the region, not just a way for Pakistan to distract from their own violations against the Sindhi people? Go ahead. I mean, that, it's, it's a valid point, and I mean, if you, if you look at post 9-11 securitization, I mean, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, I mean, all of them in their own right have very, I mean, look at the Tamil situation. I mean, look, look at Khaldazia and, you know, BNP, ANP. So it's not to justify what's happening in Sindh or with Pakhtun Mahas, etc. But, you know, I mean, these are thorny issues. Uh, you know, indeed, the, these are issues post 9-11. There's been a lot of issues here as well. So, you know, I mean, there is a recognition uh, that, you know, some of these uh, freedom of press and, uh, and other issues are areas of increasing concern. And Pakistan also, I mean, con in consideration of its image problem has to, you know, realize that these are issues which tarnish. And I mean, in, in a bilateral sense, I mean, that's kind of the space that you have without, uh, you know, without being considered intrusive. Um, so, so first of all, I'm Cindy, just to put this in context. Uh, the, the, the issue is not thousands, it's hundreds, but there's an issue. Uh, but our courts have taken notice and, and these things are being addressed. I would lead on from what Sayyid Mamdali has said, which is there are such issues in many countries, not just Pakistan. Um, and, and post 9-11, I think you were alluding to a series of events that include the United States, where these issues have, have cropped up everywhere on national security levels. So, so I think that uh, these are sensitive issues for many countries. Uh, it's happened in many places and our courts are addressing it to, to the extent people have complained and, and of course the courts are involved. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Yes, I was, uh, I was just going to add that I think human rights are a, a very um, persistent concern regarding the whole region. Uh, and that's the reason for taking a regional uh, perspective on it. It's rather to avoid the uh, response by the, our interlocutors that we're discriminating against them, picking on them. If, uh, if this is embedded in a regional policy where the U.S. is able to articulate very much the same kinds of concerns and values uh, in, the, in the bilateral piece of the relationship. I think it will be more palatable. It may or may not lead to different results, but I, that's just my two bits. Uh, all right, over on that side, the far end, gal back there, and the gentleman there, you, you in the, well, first there and then there. Um, hi, thank you for being here. Um, this is another human rights question. Um, when it comes to women and girls, Pakistan has been um, very bad on how they treat them, um, especially with forced conversions and forced um, marriages to Muslim men, if they, especially in Sindh. Um, and if women and girls are not educated, how can the economy do do anything if if you have an entire gender that isn't allowed to participate in the economy, especially in the Sindhi uh, areas. Well, I I completely agree. No, uh, yes, I have a comment and a question. My comment is that we're discussing uh, post 9/11 human uh, human rights issues, but the reality is. You can go back to 1974 and the marginalization of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, uh, which is reflective of what is now being happening in India with the marginalization of Muslim communities in India. So this is not a post 9-11 issue. But my question is that how can we put trust in foreign businesses and expats to invest in Pakistan when there's so much corruption there? Just recently, you know, uh, its own infrastructure is not being handled properly. There was a accident uh, of a train with a bus that uh, I think this past week. Uh, and that just shows you that even 
uh, infrastructure, basic infrastructure as having a, a railroad crossing signal is not available uh, due to the, you know, and this is very old technology. So how can you assure that uh, investments being made by foreign companies or by expats would have safe uh, custodianship in Pakistan? That's a good enough question. Now do you want to answer your question? Um, so, so I think the railway incident is, is one incident. Uh, there are signaling systems on the whole railway system, but there are areas where we don't have signaling if there are if there are crossings that are not used frequently, I'm familiar with that very tragic accident. But I don't think that one incident or incidents like that reflect on the business environment. The the data on the business environment is that uh, Pakistan jumped 28 places on the ease of doing business index in one year. So the business environment clearly is improving. Um, U.S. companies that are present, as well as many other foreign companies, have been very successful in Pakistan. Have enormous profits. Uh, there, I could name many companies that are U.S. companies that are building new factories in Pakistan on a, on a continuous basis, have been five years ago. There are the same companies that are building even more factories today, uh, companies like Procter & Gamble and Coca-Cola, etc. So I think that is a testament to the business environment. On your comment on, on corruption, I would say that's a, that's a problem in many countries, not just Pakistan. If you would have followed Brazilian politics, and uh, the scandal with the construction companies and, and politicians, et cetera. So there is corruption in many countries. Pakistan has been taking steps to reduce corruption. There is a strong anti-corruption uh, movement going on. Some would argue too strong, but nevertheless, there is one that's being addressed. And in any event, that is built into the ease of doing business. So many factors go into that ranking. And if we're improving significantly on that ranking, I would say on a holistic basis, uh, businesses improving. It's interesting. Um, you asked about women. Yes, the status of women in Pakistan leaves a lot to be desired. There's no question about it. There's also women and women. Uh, there are women who have successfully started businesses. There are women who have, when I was living in Pakistan in the 1970s, um, there was one woman officer in the foreign ministry. She was a fairly senior woman. She'd been a professor and was recruited from the outside. The number has gone up. It's not equal to men, but it has gone up significantly. So opportunities have opened for women with some education. Women lag in education. There are people who are working on this, and I must confess that I spend more of my time working on Bangladesh than on Pakistan, so I can't rattle off the statistics that might make you feel a little bit better. But I think you have to look at this as the work of a generation. Yeah, I think we really have to move on. If we would. Then come back and we can chat. Uh, uh, let me say that we have to constantly ask ourselves uh, whether our intervention is constructive and not too. We have to be very careful here that, in fact, as we'll hear this from civil liberties groups, that uh, uh, we, do, we don't want to certainly set uh, an understanding that somehow this is American intervention, that this, is, that this isn't a problem problem of our own, but it's so easily for people to say, uh, this has been something that a foreign hand has uh, has made worse. So we've, we do have to be very cautious. But nevertheless, I think what's coming through here is that we always have to let the others know where we stand, what our values are. Now, I'm going to take one last question because there's someone from VOA here who has a question. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, a representative from, I think, BBC and, and VOA with us. Uh, so, if you, the very last question. It's Nadeem from Voice of America. Um, my question is regarding the aid factor uh, when we talk about U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Um, because uh, most of the time, uh, the incentive has been the aid moving forward. I know Pakistan has been saying we don't want aid, we want trade. But 
how important is that factor, the aid factor in uh, the U.S.-Pakistan relations? Now, my point was uh, when I said it's not about money is that it, it shouldn't be about money. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't provide aid, but we were looking in the in the 2000s during the war on terror period, which I hope will be waning, uh, we were giving money and, and expecting a certain political support uh, in exchange for that money. That didn't really work. That didn't really work. So we need to look at assistance programs. There's poverty, there's education, all sorts of things that need to be addressed. But we need to do that in close collaboration with Pakistani counterparts so that we agree on programs, that they're programs that make sense to them and make sense to us that will really promote development, uh, not this trade of, of money for political and, and security support. If I, if I could just, just to maybe in the sense of turning the pages we've been trying to do in this conference, um, there are programs that the U.S. can do. In fact, one of the recommendations in the report is have the new U.S. Development Finance Corporation, the successor to OPEC, become more, much more active in Pakistan uh, and other such programs as well to uh, move the relationship more towards something that's sustainable, that is led by and sustained by the private sectors of both countries. Well, I think our, our time has been exhausted and maybe we've been exhausted as well. Uh, and uh, once again, I want to thank so much the people who have contributed to this, made our job as co-authors here uh, infinitely easier. Uh, and also to thank particularly the ambassador for joining us here. Uh, and those who are up here who have been willing to field the questions, thanks to you. Uh, again, hope that you'll look at the paper and that you will find it uh, uh, in your mind uh, productive uh, and constructive and will make it known to others as well. And thank you on behalf of the Middle East Institute for coming. Thank you.